In a quiet rural graveyard in Gloucestershire lies the grave of one of the 11 men awarded the Victoria Cross at the Battle of Rorkstrift, South Africa, in 1879. The battle was made famous in the film Zulu, and in it, one of those Victoria Cross recipients is a bit of a rum anti-hero. And if you've seen the film, you'll know who I'm talking about. Private Henry Hook. His character, played by James Booth in the film, was a cockney, insubordinate barrack room lawyer who questions why he's even fighting the Zulus. He's a drunk, who's been put on field punishment, a malinger in hospital, and who his sergeant says of him, I know you, Hook. You're no good, Hook. Despite all this, Hookie comes good as he saves the patients in the hospital as it's stormed by the Zulus, and is awarded Britain's highest medal for bravery. However, that was not the real Henry Hook at all. Far from it. The real Henry Hook was a teetotaler, a model soldier, who served his country for over 40 years. And far from being a malinger in the hospital, he was actually the cook who, after the battle, was found making tea for the men. And he wasn't even a Londoner. He came from over 100 miles away in Gloucestershire. The film Zulu does this Victorian soldier a huge disservice. It's time to tell the real story of Henry Hook VC, a very humble warrior. Albert Henry Hook was born on the 6th of August 1850 in the Forest of Dean, Gloucestershire. He was the eldest of six children, born to a farm labourer and his wife from the tiny hamlet of Churchham, about six miles west of Gloucester. The Hooks had been living in the area for at least 200 years, and it would be to Churchham that Henry Hook VC would return on his final journey in 1905. In 1870, just short of his 20th birthday, he married Comfort Jones, and they were to have three children, a boy and two girls. In the previous year, he had enlisted as a volunteer with the Monmouthshire Militia. Eight years later, in March 1877, he enlisted in the regular army. Private Henry Hook, service number 1373, joined the 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment of Foot. Quite what motivated him to sign up is lost in the mists of history. Maybe he loved the army life that he discovered in the militia. Maybe it offered him a better job security than his civilian role as a workman. Maybe his marriage wasn't as happy as intended. Maybe he simply wanted adventure. Who knows? But if it was a venture he was after, he was certainly going to get it in South Africa less than two years later. As an experienced militiaman, Hook only had to complete three months training at the regiment's depot in Brecon before he joined the regiment in Kent. The following year, his 2nd Battalion were en route to South Africa aboard the troop ship HMS Himalaya. The 2nd Battalion, 24th Regiment of Foot, fought under Lord Chelmsford in the 9th Khosa War. They then moved in July 1879 to the British colony of Natal, where tensions were rising with the neighbouring Zulu Kingdom. When, in January 1879, Chelmsford led a British invasion of Zululand, a small garrison of less than 140 men, mainly from B Company, 2nd Battalion, were left at the mission station at Rourke's Drift on the British side of the border. I've made several videos about Rourke's Drift and the soldiers who fought there, and I'll post some links both at the end of this video and in the descriptions below so you can watch them later. The mission station had been converted into a supply depot and also a hospital, and inside the hospital were a small number of patients, some wounded in an earlier skirmish with the Zulus, but most suffering from tropical diseases or accidents. And it was in this hospital that we find Henry Hook on the afternoon of the 22nd of January, 1879. However, the reality in the film diverge at this point. In the film, Hook, played by James Booth, is malingering in hospital, feigning injury so he doesn't have to do any soldiering. He suggests to Surgeon Reynolds that a spot of medicinal brandy will help the situation. However, Reynolds, who refers to him as my malingering Hector, simply lances a boil on his back instead. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. This is so far from the truth. Firstly, Hook was not malingering in the hospital. He was actually working as the cook, preparing food and drinks for the patients. And secondly, he certainly would not have been trying to sample any medicinal brandy, as back in August, he had taken the pledge to abstain from alcohol with the Temperance Society, the Good Templars. Indeed, later he would claim that he was making tea for the men when exhausted and dishevelled mounted men rode in and relayed the jaw-dropping news that half of Chelmsford's column had been wiped out at Isandwana and that a Zulu army of over 4,000 was heading for the mission station. 
As the tiny garrison fortified the mission station, Hook was dispatched to defend the hospital. In the film, he shows a complete unwillingness to prepare for the fight, refusing to create any loopholes. He has a showdown with his sergeant and afterwards laments that the sergeant had previously sentenced him to field punishment and sent his pay to Hook's wife. No such showdown or punishment took place. In fact, shortly before the battle, he received a good conduct payment rather than field punishment. Where the film Zulu and reality do come back together is during the actual Zulu attack. In the film, the rebel Hook comes good as he bravely defends the patients in the hospital and holds off the Zulus as the British retreat room by room. And that bit of the film is, well, basically correct. Hook himself told his story on numerous occasions afterwards, and over the years it remained pretty consistent. During the initial attack by the Zulus, Hook, who was a pretty good marksman, hit a warrior at 400 yards. He then spotted a Zulu, hiding behind an anthill about 300 yards from the hospital. His first shot went high. His second shot hit the dust just in front of the target. He was not sure if his third shot hit his opponent, but the Zulu never popped up again. Next day, he would go looking for that man, and you'll find out what happened later in this story. By 7pm in the dark of the African night, the Zulus managed to set the thatch of the hospital roof alight. Hook, along with Private John Williams, fought his way from room to room through the burning hospital with the Zulus behind him. Williams was forced to dig holes through the walls of each room to escape the Zulus, and whilst he did so, Hook, armed with his rifles and bayonet, held them at bay. It was a desperate and terrifying retreat. Imagine a pitch black room except for the light from that burning roof. The smoke from that roof along with the smoke from the rifle fire. Petrified and helpless patients, Zulus uttering battle cries and hacking the doors of their assegais before finally breaking into the gloomy rooms to kill the men inside. As Hook later said, he felt like they were pinned like rats. Time and again the Zulus tried to grab the barrel of his rifle, but Hook had the better grip and was able to wrench it free each time. On one occasion, he fired into his attacker's breast at point-blank range. He recalled five or six dead Zulus lying at his feet as he fought them in that confined space. Zulus desperately threw their assegais through the door in the hope of hitting Hook. And they did. An assegai, or spear, whizzed across the top of his head, splitting the skin of his scalp. And that scalp wound, where his hair never grew, remained with him for the rest of his life. As Williams broke through each room, Hook would then push the patients after him, all the while trying to hold off the Zulus. In one room, an Irish soldier, Private Connolly, couldn't move due to a broken leg. Hook grabbed him and shoved him through the hole, breaking Connolly's leg again. But needs must. Eventually, they reached the last room, closest to the rest of the British garrison, and were able to climb out of a window and drop six feet down the other side. As in the film, Hook brought up the rear, but unlike the film, he didn't help himself to the missionary's brandy. Instead, he helped the injured Connolly out and then carried him across his back to safety. The fighting that had raged so fiercely earlier in the night eventually petered out around dawn. Hook was one of several men detailed with going out to collect any spare rifles that were lying around. And it was during this task that Hook had a nasty surprise. He had ventured a little bit further out to see if he could find that warrior who he'd been shooting at behind the anthill the previous afternoon. He found him, lying behind the anthill with a bullet wound through his forehead. It seems Henry Hook was a much better shot than the film made out. As he retraced his steps, he passed a prone Zulu on the floor. And in his head he thought it rather odd that he was still bleeding even though he was dead. And before his brain could compute the danger signs, the Zulu had leapt up and tried to seize his rifle. In the ensuing tussle, Hook managed to knock the man over and then slip a cartridge into his rifle and shoot him at close range. He hurried back to the British barricade. As the sun rose in the sky on the 23rd of January, what remained of Lord Chelmsford's column approached out of Zululand, and seeing them, the Zulus withdrew. The Battle of Rourke's Drift was over. As I said earlier, if you'd like to find out more about the battle, please watch my other videos. In the film, Hero Hook reverts to form and immediately tries to get back into the sick bay. In reality, Henry Hook did revert to form, just a very different form. Without even pausing to wash his blackened hands and face, he started to make tea for the men. And it was whilst he was making the tea, having thrown off his tunic, that he was told to report to Lord Chelmsford immediately. All in a fluster, he stood to attention in front of the commander without his tunic and with his braces hanging down, 
whilst he gave an account of his actions in the hospital. Lord Chelmsford shook his grubby hand and congratulated him on his bravery. Henry Hook was one of 11 defenders at Rourke's Drift to be awarded the Victoria Cross, and he was the only one to actually receive his medal at Rourke's Drift when Chelmsford's successor, General Sir Garnet Walsley, presented it to him later that year. He recalled that after the ceremony, many men offered him a drink, but being true to his vow of abstinence, he refused. He would remain teetotal for the rest of his life and would later become a Methodist lay preacher. Certainly not the character portrayed in the film. Hardly surprising, based upon what you now know about the real Henry Hook VC, his family strongly protested about the way he was portrayed in Zulu. After the war, Henry Hook bought himself out of the army and was discharged in June 1880. He applied to work as a janitor at the British Museum, but it seems that being a recipient of Britain's highest medal for valour was not enough to get him this reasonably lowly job. He took letters from his officer at Lorks Drift, Lieutenant Bromhead, as well as Lord Chelmsford and even the Prince of Wales to get him through the door. On the 26th of December 1880, he started his new job as duster of books in the museum's famous round reading room. He was to work at the British Museum for the next 24 years, eventually becoming the caretaker for members' umbrellas. Visitors remember him in the 1890s as a short man, he was about five foot seven, with broad shoulders and a kindly face. And beneath his apron, he wore his uniform, complete with Victoria Cross pinned to his 42-inch chest. On his return to Britain, Henry Hook found that his wife, Comfort, had entered into a bigamous marriage with a man from Gloucester. Now, records are murky as to exactly what happened and when. But the commonly held story is that Comfort had not heard from Henry since he had arrived in South Africa and had presumed him dead. Eventually they divorced and in 1897 he married Ada Taylor from London. They would have two girls, the eldest of which, Victoria Catherine, has the initials VC Hook. Coincidence? <laughs> I guess we'll never know. Despite leaving the regular army, which cost him £18 to do at the time, it didn't take long for Henry Hook VC to once more join a volunteer battalion. In this instance, seeing as he was living in London, it was the 17th North Middlesex Rifle Volunteers, where he was promoted to Lance Corporal. Shortly afterwards, he moved to the 1st Volunteer Battalion of the Royal Fusiliers. This unit had been formed in 1859 by Thomas Hughes, the author of Tom Brown's School Days, in which we first meet prize cad and anti-hero Harry Flashman. Hook would serve in the Volunteers for 20 years and rise to the rank of Instruction Sergeant. However, his health would never be the same after Rourke's drift. The assegai wound to his scalp gave him increasing discomfort as the years went by, and after his return to England, he suffered from breathing problems and consumption, or as we now would call it, tuberculosis. Dusting all those books in the British Museum probably didn't help matters, nor would the London smogs of the 19th century. Eventually, his doctor advised him to seek the fresher air of the countryside, and so on the 1st of January, 1905, he retired to his native Gloucestershire. He moved into two Osborne villas in Rosebury Avenue, Gloucester. When I recently visited the road, I found that whilst Rosebury Avenue is still there, Osborne villas are no longer standing. Unfortunately, the retirement would not be a long or happy one. His lungs were giving up, and on the 12th of March that year, Henry Hook VC died from tuberculosis. He was just 54 years old. Thousands lined the route of his funeral cortege as it made its way from his house on the six-mile journey to the parish church at Churchham, where he'd been baptised. The hearse was flanked by detachments from the South Wales Borderers, formerly the 24th Regiment of Foot, and the 1st Volunteer Battalion of the Royal Fusiliers. And there in the graveyard of St Andrew's Church in the tiny hamlet, he was laid to rest. His weathered headstone has been restored in recent years and still attracts visitors who wish to pay their respects to this remarkable, humble hero. His epitaph, taken from the Old Testament, reads, If our time is come, let us die manfully for our brethren's sake. A man who was not a barrack room lawyer, drunk or malingerer, but a fine Victorian gentleman, a teetotaler, and a model soldier who served in uniform for 45 years and was honoured with Britain's highest medal of valour. Albert Henry Hook VC. 1850 to 1905.
Thanks for joining me today and I hope you enjoyed that story. Check out all my other videos about Rourke's Drift, in particular the one about how the film Zulu deviates from the actual events. There's a link coming up in a moment. Loads more videos on my channel for you to enjoy and lots more planned too, so please make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the new releases. In the meantime, thanks for your support, keep well and I'll see you again very soon.